the time has come for my people to go. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's what the people demand, and we're gonna keep fighting till we get that land. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's time to rise to get what we want, we got to organize. Greetings, all. You are watching the Pantsilla podcast. It is a podcast of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. And the All African Revolutionary Party objective is to have a unified socialist government under scientific socialism. And we talk about that from episode to episode and we will continue to. And we're gonna actually have a specific episode on what socialism is. Stay tuned for that. But right now we have a special guest. I am so excited. I am Jamila, if I have not said my name. <laughs> uh, Oh my goodness. We have known each other. We, we were just talking, I think uh, 2014, 2013, something like that. And to see your evolution, Eli Wananda, AKA Africans Arise. <laughs> to see the evolution of your content has been amazing. And to see the shifts that you've taken on various subjects, on Africa, on capitalism, on your own life in terms of raising a family. I love watching your evolution and I wanted to speak with you about said evolution today amongst other things. <laughs> oh. If you can talk about your evolution as African arises. So this is actually a two part question. Uh, so if you can uh, talk about the name Africans arise and then I'll ask you the questions. Yeah, sure. Wow, thank you. That's that's all. That's all very. <laughs> it's all very humbling and uh, and uh, inspiring as well to to hear. And like you said, yeah, it's that was. It's been a. It's been a few years. It's been a few years. I remember your channel that you had, and like I used to. It was. It was a wrench when you left YouTube. That was a. That was a wrench. You know, uh, over over one of YouTube or Google's privacy many 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 privacy you know grabs basically and you were like you know what nah not this time i'm gone bye <laughs> so so that was a, that was like yeah it was admirable i admired you but it was a bit of a wrench because it was like oh man this is this is like this is family like one of my youtube kind of family you know peeps authentic authentic peeps so um, so yeah, it's, thank you. I'm honoured and and I'm very I'm very um, blessed to be on on the podcast. And um, uh, yeah, so Africans Arise. Africans Arise uh, is a uh, the title Africans Arise. Kind of. So I I actually had an older YouTube channel uh, that was like a, a a kind of religious channel. Like I'd, I was a I was a Christian, and then I sort of moved more toward like a kind of Hebrew Israelite. But not fully involved Hebrew is like more just like yeah I kind of hold to this stuff but I, didn't, I wasn't in any camp or or anything like that um, and then over a period of time I kind of like um, you know I moved away from the, the the whole Bible and and kind of biblical worldview at that time anyway um, and then I, and I more became much more reconnected uh, much more to my um, my African heritage, you know, my Africanness and my blackness, which was always there, which is one of the reasons why, you know, I moved to the Hebrew Israelite kind of <laughs> side of things, because I was like, well, okay, well, you know, you always, it's almost like your, your Africanness is always pulling you, me anyway, it's always pulling me to, yeah, but okay, this is all well and good, but, you know, how does this speak to me as an African? How does this speak to our reality? And, and so, um, so yeah, I, I kind of started to, I, I started to think, okay, I need a channel. I need, I want to do something about our people, something that's inspiring, something that's uplifting, something that's going to be focused on the African diaspora and the connections between us as Africans, as Black people around the world. Uh, and yeah, I just, I just kind of went through a few names. I thought, oh, Africans arise. How about that? And I remember I asked a friend of mine, one sister, like, yeah, what do you think about this then? And she was like, oh, I love it. Very inspiring. <laughs> 
And I was like, cool, all right, let's do that. Africa's Arise, it is then. And um, yeah, that was in 20, that was in 2009. So we're, what's that now, 12, yeah, 12 years, that's 12 years. <sighs> that Africans of Rice has existed. Um, but yeah, that was that was a ru the rough um, evolu the evolution prior to Africans of Rise in a very nutshell. And that was the idea about the, 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 the name, yeah, unity and uprising and, you know, progress of black people around the world. Mm. So uh, this is the two part question. So being an African, what does being an African mean to you specifically because you are a continental African living in the diaspora currently. So what does that mean to you in your journey as an African? Okay, what does that being an African mean to me uh, uh, in, in my journey as an African? Uh, so, oh, that's a, that's a weird one because yeah, being an African is kind of like, it's everything weirdly for, for me. It's kind of, it's kind of um, it's a bit like asking what, what does it mean to be Ellie, you know, because it's, like, oh, it's just who, it's just what I am and who I am. But I suppose being African is is being being a part of a family, a a, a global family, a global uh, tribe, if you like, a, a, a collection of tribes. But it's, I just see us as like one one tribe of black people who who are magnificent in so many ways we are you know we are unique in so many different ways uh, physically unique spiritually unique well we've got a lot we've got a lot of you know a lot of similarities to a lot of other other people but you know there's also many many ways in which we're unique but just we're you know we're the people of the motherland we're the people of uh, of 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 the the land mass of africa al kebulan whatever you want to call it and all along the way for at least the last, you know, the last, uh, well, I mean, probably for most of recorded history from what I understand, even if you go back to like the, you know, the times of the um, uh, Kemet and, you know, they were always, they were always being attacked. They were always being, you know, they were always fighting a, a rear guard battle against outsiders who were trying to come into Africa and, you know, and and uh, loot and change us and dominate us and so forth, and yeah, there's this. It's like there's this 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 constant battle that we've been facing, and for a lot of the time we we were winning, particularly if you, if you look at Kemet and you know other parts of Kush, Kemet Kush, and so forth. You know, there were mighty powers. You know, big 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 um, feared powers. But um, unfortunately, for the last, the best part of the last what one and a half thousand years 1500 years or so particularly since the arab uh, slave trade we have been we've been in our you could say our dark ages in a sense because progressively you know more and more and more bit by bit by bit we've, we've been getting more and more um uh dominated by others and now particularly in the last 500 years with the onslaught of the europeans it's been you know it's been a dark time for us but even within that darkness you know there's light there's always light and you know i can i can never it's a temptation i've been down that path before a temptation to kind of like almost like turn away from your blackness and your africanness and say look we're losers we're just let's forget about all this and let's just follow what these other people are trying to get us to do because maybe that's the way forward and but uh, I think, thank, thankfully, I've I've turned away from that, and um, you know, my I will never I will never not be uh, proud of being a black man. Never not be proud of being an African, and I'll always, you know, my heart's desire will always be to you know to see us unite and see us liberate ourselves. Um, that's a long-winded answer to. <laughs> that's kind of what Af being African means to me. It's like a triumph and tragedy, all kind of. It, in together, but with a hopefulness of we will win, you know? Venceremos. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the second part of the question. You sort of responded to it, but the evolution that you've taken in terms of a class analysis, in terms of even an analysis or an identity or an affinity with Pan-Africanism 
in Africans Arise, does symbolize uh, Pan-Africanism in its own way. And I want to uh, talk to talk about uh, Asagiafo uh, Kwame Nkrumah's quote regarding Pan-Africanism. And this is actually uh, on the All African People's Revolutionary Party. It's the top of our international site. So quote, the total liberation and unification of Africa under an all African socialist government must be the primary objective of all black revolutionaries throughout the world. It is an objective which when achieved will bring about the fulfillment of the aspirations of Africans and people of African descent everywhere. It will at the same time advance the triumph of the international socialist revolution and the onward progress towards world communism under which every society is ordered on the principle of from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. And I thought about a post that you made today. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you saw that then. <laughs> yes, I did. I said, oh, I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> like you said, some of our Pan-African brethren are very fuzzy around the topic of capitalism. They sometimes sort of admit that it's bad, but they never go into specifics. This is a neat explanation of exactly how capitalism exploits workers, any Pan-Africanism or Black nationalism, et cetera, that fails to explain and explicitly oppose capitalism cannot lead us to liberation. And you posted an explanation of capitalism by a uh, Marxist e economist, Richard Wolff. Mm. And I have seen you over the years sort of not say capitalism is great, but said, you know, somehow it has merit somewhere and it has some sort of benefit possibly. And to see this, mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm interested in that evolution to mm -hmm. from, well, it, it may have some benefit to, yeah, it's, it's about theft and exploitation. So mm -hmm. how did you go to that from that part of your journey to where you are today? Yeah, good question. Good question. Uh, so, what happened with me so yeah i was what happened what is it so there was there's because the, the, i think what it is there's there's something about the world as it is and the way that it's presented to us that can be quite um beguiling i suppose is, is, is the term i'm thinking so when i was you know say about five yeah five five six years ago i was you know solidly socialist you know but what i think i think the thing is i probably hadn't thought i was socialist but you know you can be, you can you can hold to like an ideology or hold to a position but maybe you haven't you haven't critically come to that position perhaps you haven't really thoroughly uh, you haven't really thoroughly had to defend your ideology you haven't really thoroughly had to, you know what i mean in the face of like really strong kind of uh critique and you know the best of the critique that's out there kind of thing you you've not maybe not had to do much of that or even looked at much of that and that that probably was where i was um and also i think what happens is with me was that life happens person you know my personal life kind of you know was was happening so i was you know um younger younger than i am now um looking for a partner you know looking for you know trying trying to move on to that next stage of my life to you know start a family and blah 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 and i think probably and and my career as well this that's the other thing i think is important is that my career was kind of developing as well I was starting to get to a stage where you know I was moving into more senior positions and seeing like oh okay this is good so I'm getting you know I'm starting to get more money if, you know in this uh, in this system and I suppose there's a there's an element in that where you can kind of think you can start to lose 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 your um clarity of what's going on and kind of think well actually no maybe actually no we can just make our way in this in this society no we can we can succeed if we put our mind to it and if we just uh you know if we just stop doing stupid things and start doing good things you know you can you sometimes like you, your heads can start start to swell when you're you know when you're when you're presented with with this, with with progress as it is in you know in 
uh, in this in a, a sort of middle class kind of life. So 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 that was happening, and then um, I think one of so the the big the big trap that I fell into was starting to starting to buy into the buy into the critique criticizing black people for the problems that we find ourselves in. So if you look at my channel, if you look at the videos on my channel, that's that's the trajectory you'll start to see is like, okay, yeah, you know, da -da -da -da, pan Africanism, yeah, da -da. and then, oh, actually, no, we need to stop doing this now. We need to stop doing that. Actually, why don't we stop doing this? <laughs> and then um, it's all, for me, it was like almost like a, re like a relief, like, oh my God, I can, st I can say these things. I can, I can start to, you know, talk about, uh, single parent families and how, yeah, actually single parent families are the problem, you know, and um, I don't know, ch uh, childbirth out of wedlock, you know, all these kind of conservative talking points, which I suppose uh, maybe might be part of what I was talking about when you haven't critically confronted some of the critiques of co socialism, com communism, socialism or whatever. And I started coming across all those things in the changed kind of uh, headspace that I was in as a result of the personal stuff that I was that I was talking about. And it was just beguiling. Yeah, it was just like, you know what, actually, yeah, this is true. Yeah, you can. We can make our way. Black people can make our way, you know, um, in this in this in this world. It's not that bad. It's fine, actually, because look, at, look. And so looking at how other people are doing, oh, look, they're doing well. So why are we making such a big deal of it? And then that as well, that was at around about a time when uh, what, what actually happened as well was more and more not black people started to see some of this content that I was putting out and like kind of co-sign it. So yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Um, how can I summarize it? Probably what was happening was that uh, when you're a pan, I think when you're a pan Africanist or or a revolutionary or you know what I mean, like anything like that, you're gonna be in society almost in like two worlds. You're in you're in capitalism and you're having to work within capitalism and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but all the while you're there, knowing this is BS. You know, this is just this is all based on exploitation. This is all based on you know. The, uh, the 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 crushing of African people and other peoples around the world, and it, that tension can kind of get a bit <laughs> a bit heavy, you know. Um, and I think yeah, basically it just got I just you know I was like you know what let me just let me just go with the let me just stop trying to you know hold to hold to this revolutionary stuff and just like you know get my head down and just and kind of you know carry on and you know so that that's that's roughly was what was happening there. And then the funny thing is not funny but the 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 what started to draw me back, you know, clear my head and draw me back was uh, two. Well, two main events. One was the Windrush scandal in the in in the UK. Um, so, do you know about the 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 whole that whole kind of situation with Windrush and the the immigrants from the African immigrants from the Caribbean and so forth? Who anyway, go on. Yeah. You... Yes, but uh, you being in uh, the UK, can you explain more? But yeah, I have read. Some things about it yeah it was basically uh so the, the 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 africans from the caribbean who came particularly from the caribbean there were people from other parts of the world but it was mainly the africans from the caribbean who came in the to the uk from the 50s 60s and 70s in particular uh, they came here on british passports because you know they were colonies they were they were currently at that time you know colonized by britain and so they came here and because it was all free movement you know we're, we're subjects of the col of the mother country they came here thinking oh this is great then we're just you know we're just here in the mother country that's all it was um and then over time the, you know the, the the host governments here in the face of a lot of uh anti-black backlash you know about all this immigration, started to change the rules and start to put in these requirements for, you know, you got to get certain paperwork and this, that and the other to be able to stay here. Um, but a lot of these Africans didn't, either didn't know about that or didn't take it, you know, they didn't realize, didn't realize the severity of it. And then uh, in 2017, I think it was, um, they started deporting a bunch of these people and you know, people who were like in their 60s, 70s, they, you know, they started just deporting them, saying, Oh, where's your proof of being here? And they're like, What are you talking about? I came here, 
I came here from Jamaica when it was a colony and I've been here for 50 years. I've been paying my taxes. I've been working. My children are here, my grandchildren are here. They were like, yeah, no, nah, get out. <laughs> um, I'm laughing, but, and that was, and the funny thing with that is people used to say to like, when we were growing up, people, even, you know, people would say stuff like, yeah, but you know what? They could kick us out at any time, you know? And I, you'd, I'd be like, come on, don't be silly. And particularly when I was in my, that, that stage of kind of neo, neoconservative, whatever it was, black conservative phase, I'd have been like, no, the rule of law rule, you know, hold sway in Britain. They wouldn't do something like that. <laughs> you silly pan, you, I don't know, you silly uh, black, you know, revolutionary. Uh, and then that, so that was like a kind of, oh, wait a second. It was like a, a, a reminder. No, they, they will do something like that, you know. So that was one big thing. And then another thing as well, was the fire at um, Grenfell Tower in 20, I think that was 2017. And that was, that hit me on like quite a visceral level because I, it's, so Grenfell Tower is a, is a, I don't know what you call it, like a tenement block. I don't know if, if that's what you call it in the US, but it's like a tower block, we call it in the UK. Um, owned by the council, uh, social housing, you know, full up mainly of black and brown people, that particular one, just like the one I grew up in, in, in Hackney in East London. But this was in West London, in a in Kensington, a part of Kensington, a very posh part of Kensington. Here, and here they call it the projects too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes, that's a good word for it. Yeah, the projects, the projects. Yeah. But the PJs, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the hood. <laughs> and there was a fire basically, and I, the reason why it hit me hit me viscerally is that I used to live in a tower block like that when I was very very young here in London and they used to have fires quite often in there like there'd be fires in like the rubbish chutes at the bottom and I remember the smell the, the thick black smoke the fire engines would come and the smell was just like ugh. and then I just you know the thought of like wait a sec what if one of those fires just engulfed the whole tower block and what a horrific way to die that would be. And then at, at that time, I'd been looking into like the politics of land and how uh, land uh, uh, land is basically such a big driver of inequality in this country and well, around the world, frankly. And how in a place like Kensington, where this fire was, you've got like very posh, very wealthy people, you know, one side of the road living across the road from these people living in these tower blocks who are mainly black and brown. And that hit me hard, the, the, the response of the government, they just didn't give a shit, basically, part of my French. Uh, they, they were just not bothered at all about it. And that really, really hit me. That got to, And it was a really, really hot summer's day when that happened. It was like boiling hot by London standards. And I just, I don't know, all these, all those sensory things just all came together. And I, I just had to step away and just think, okay, all right. And then, yeah, from, from then went a bit quiet overall and then, you know, having small children a bit later after that, I just, I was like, look, man, I know what I'm going. And also one more other thing, personal thing is that I moved out of London and moved to a, to a town outside of London, which is predominantly white, reawoke, reawakened me to the fact that this is a white country. And, you know, these people are looking at us like we're, you know what I mean? All of that came together. And I just, it, I just, re, it just reawakened my, um, my blackness within me that was calling, you know, it called, called me back to, um, back to the, to the kind of revolutionary path. And yeah, here I am. That's, that's kind of what happened. <laughs> Sorry, that's a very, very, very long answer. <laughs> oh, those, are, those are good answers, the journey. And it made me think of uh, the Muta, Muta Baruka song, it's no good to stay in a white man country too long. <laughs> yeah, for real, for real. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. with right. that, I'm wondering because there there was a bit of time where you started exploring Afro pessimism.
Mm. So how was that journey that you explored with Afro-pessimism, did that coincide with your more conservative views? No, no, no. Okay. no. So Afro-pessimism, I, I first heard about Afro-pessimism probably a year ago, not that long ago, very, very recently. And um, no, it wasn't, that wasn't in that, I would have laughed Afro-pessimism out of the room, like in my conservative phase, because I, so back, back then I was talking a lot about how, you know, there was like this pro-black inferiority complex, as I called it. I've got a video still up because I think they're useful to see pe for people to see my journey. Um, and I was talking about how, oh, these black people who keep running around talking about how, you know, uh, how hard things are and how bad things are and how the white man's trying to get us down and so forth. So I would have, if, if I'd have heard about Afro-pessimism then, I would have been, I would have been, I would have said, look, this is exactly what I'm critiquing, this kind of mentality. So no, this, this Afro-pessimism came about last year and probably, so my, my, a, a, a good friend of mine, Kevin Cobham, Bismarck Cobham, who's been on my channel a few times, he's the one who told me about it. I never heard of it. He's the one who told me about it. And um, I think probably the aftermath of George Floyd's killing, murder, murder, uh, pr probably then was where I was mo I was most open to starting to to remembering. I think it's it's kind of like all these things we know we know we know that non-black people see us as in a certain way. Do you know what I mean? We know that our position in the world is more than just a sort of you know a personal dislike that people have towards us. There's something deep about. Well, why is it that everywhere you go around the world, people, we're at the bottom. Why do people hate us so much? Why is it that you, no matter where you go, you, you know, you'll get the monkey chance and this, that, and the other. All black people know that deep down. You know, they they know deep down that there's there's something quite unique about our position in the world. Um, but then after the after the 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 you know the killing of George Floyd and the the the, the reawakening of racial consciousness as it seemed amongst a lot of black people uh that certainly was a case for me as well it was like a, I was open then to kind of hear from your Frank Wildersons and others like oh so what are you talking what is this and yeah it, I just um for, for me Afro-pessimism is nothing new it's basically you know saying in very higher register language things that many, many other people have already, have, have already said, from Amos Wilson to Dr. Marimba Ani to various other people, you know, it's, it's kind of bringing it all together. And, and um, it's very, prov it's, sorry, you didn't, did you want me to, to, to go off? But anyway, yeah, so my, my thing on the Afro-pessimism is that it's, um, yeah, it, it's a very necessary um, tool in our armory as if you're, if you're a, Pan-Africanist, or if you're some, if even if you're a black nationalist or whatever you want to call yourself, I think it's important, very necessary to get to grips as best as you can with pan with um, Afro-pessimism because it just helps. To, I think it just helps to um, helps to it helps you to not be shocked when stuff like these killings, extra judicial killings and, and things like that happen and whatnot. It's just like, yeah, of course they're doing that. Of course they're treating us like that. Of course they are. It's necessary to their understanding of what the world is and what their position is in the world is. Our being at the bottom is necessary for that, you know, so don't be shocked, don't be surprised and organize on that basis, you know. Yeah, so. Yeah, I think that the little I've looked into Afro-pessimism, it does, uh, I don't look at it as uh, analogous with Pan-Africanism, um, particularly the fifth Pan-Africanist Congress, where, you know, which is where the AAPRP sort of takes his line or is inspired by its line, because mm -hmm. it's saying that our destiny is so rooted in our enslavement just a, a basic reading of Afro-pessimism. And it's hard to look at the works of Walter Rodney, for instance, or you know, any books connecting our enslavement and capitalism. And you're like, well, this is tied to our destiny because it leaves out any slave revolts. It leaves out uh, 
the future that we have when we do organize against the system. And so if we, I think using it as a tool to learn from is one thing, but sticking to it and be like, well, we're tied to this destiny of our enslavement and there's nothing we can do. That's, you know, I know there's lots of debates around what that means, but if we just stick to this tool in the toolbox and run with it, it's ignoring so much of our history. It's ignoring uh, the Haitian revolution. It's ignoring, um, again, any slave revolts that have occurred and will continue to occur. And we're seeing that around the world right now, so many revolts against this system of oppression, this inhumane system of capitalism. And so I do agree with you in the way, again, using it to study um, our history of enslavement, but don't stay there. And I feel like the, the few writings I have seen in relation to Afro-pessimism sort of stay there. And so what this is tied to our destiny. And so this is what we have to go on and we have to work from that. And, and we're also tied to that in capitalist indoctrination that, oh, well, y'all were enslaved, you know, this is what y'all get. And so can you speak to that? Yeah, I think, what so with Afro-pessimism, you, you, you hinted at uh, that there were debates in Afro-pessimism. Um, Afro-pessimism is, there are a number of kind of key figures. So Frank Wilderson is the person who most people have heard of because he's the he's the one who makes the most effort to get out to the to the masses kind of thing. But there's a bunch of other people. Jared Sexton is another one. David Marriott, Saidiya Hartman. Some of these might not even call themselves Afro pessimists, but these are some of the some of the figures. Um, Calvin Warren is another one. Um, Zakia Imam Jackson, I think her name is. There's, there's a very and. One of my things with these guys is that I'm not someone who's used to reading things like that because they're not they're not talking about um, they're not really talking about oh you know this is what you know here's some history this is what happened here da, 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 da. and then you know the reason that happened you know they're not talking about political economy they're not talking about um, you know military they, what they what they're looking so there's political economy they're talking about they folk. Wilderson talks about it as the libidinal economy, which is the, uh, they're talking uh, in the, about ontology, you know, and um, in the libidinal, libidinal economy or the collective unconscious, so this is how Wilderson puts it, in the collective unconscious of non-Black people, Black people are seen as, uh, are the opposite of human in their collective unconscious. There's humans, and then there's black people, and the concept of human gets its clarity and its its um, you know its contours set by the fact that there's got to be this outside of human category, which is where we are in their collective unconscious. But it's not just in their collective unconscious because it translates into the political economy. So it translates into the slavery, the Arab enslavement of us. It translates into the European enslavement of us. It translates into the monkey chance. It translates into the police, um, you know, stop and search. Uh, it translates into, you know, colonialism, neocolonialism and so forth. Um, but what they're focusing on is how these people view us. And they do say that, yes, our position, what well, Wilderson says, our position is, an, is, is the position of the slave. Nothing changed in the collective unconscious of not black people, nothing changed from emancipation to now. And this is something, when I said that that's nothing new, Amos Wilson says the same thing in the blueprint of black power, he's he, blueprint for black power. He says the same thing. He talks us through what language do you speak? What clothes do you wear? What God do you serve? What really, you know, what um, food do you eat? All of those things shaped, all of those things are things from slavery, you know? So as much as we might think that we're, we are free and liberated. We're not. Um, so, but what? What? what I'd, so you were saying about the? Um, I, I'm not sure. I've heard them say that our destiny is tied to our in, is is tied to our future. What they're saying is that our our present is tied to our enslavement. But what? What? What I think is powerful about Afro pessimism is that they're saying, listen. Don't get caught up with, uh, don't get caught up with these so-called solutions that get thrown to us, 
because all of these so-called solutions that get thrown to us are just going to continue the, the status quo. So black capitalism is the obvious example. Yeah, we just need to get some more businesses and, you know, or electoral politics. We just need to get a black, you know, black, more black people in, in the White House and this, that and the other. All of these things are just continuing um, civil society. You know, they're just strengthening our oppression. They're just continuing continuing with the, with the status quo. What Afro-pessimism, Afro-pessimists like Wilderson say is that, no, we need something that is going to be very violent and very cataclysmic because what needs to end is the world. The world needs to end. The world as it is, as it's, um, as, the, the, as it's conceptualized, as I said, you know, the humans and Africans, black people outside, that collect, you know, that um, ontological relationship needs to end and it's gonna take, it's gonna take cataclysmic violence. And Wilderson actually does talk about he refers back in glowing terms to some of these slave revolts because he he says that look, that wasn't oh let's tweak and you know let's let's just reform and maneuver. It was you look at those and you look at those. I was reading about was it Nat Turner Nat, the Nat Turner rebellion that was killing a lot of Wazungu. You know that that was very very violent. Same with the Haitian Revolution that you talked about extremely violent you know i mean shockingly violent when you, when you consider what they did after they'd beaten the french armies they then you know they exacted a pretty drastic um toll on the remaining french people who were there you know um he, he, he doesn't necessarily say yeah, that's what we're gonna have to just go out there and just you know kill all these people but i think what for me where afro pessimism is powerful is because it's it's it in that sense, it puts it it um, puts the emphasis on cataclysmic change needed, cataclysmic revolution, revolution that is not just changing the people who are in the positions of power, not just even putting a different party in power, or not just you know, it's something. And so, where Afropism, Afro pessimism falls short for me, or where Afro pessimism pessimism isn't useful is giving any details about that. Because <laughs> Wilderson says like, yeah, well, when, whenever he's asked about it, he's like, well, that's not for me to come up with, the, you know, I'm not here to tell you how to do it, but I'm just kind of giving you the, which is, which is at first I was like, oh, come on, this isn't very helpful. <laughs> so he's got an interview with, um, on I Mix What I Like with um, Jared Ball and, all the, and a couple of other guys, Dr. Hayton, another guy. And um, they ask him that and he's like, yeah, uh, I'm not here, I, I can't really say, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm a university professor. I'm not here to kind of tell you what to do. Um, and at first I was kind of like, okay, that's a bit of a cop out. But actually now I'm, I'm reconciled to that because that's fine. Yeah, he, he, it's a tool for understanding our position in the world and for under, and starting to, starting to come to grips with what we're gonna need to liberate ourselves and that's it. The rest of it is kind of down to us to <laughs> work out how to, how to do it, um, if, that, if that makes sense. But, um, overall, Afro pessimism very dense, very very complicated to understand. I'm not even. I mean, I'm talking here as if I'm that's some Afro, Afro pessimist expert. I don't even understand a lot of that stuff. It's very deep. It's very philosophical and abstract and so forth. So you know, it does take time to. Well, I suppose what I'd say is just like people shouldn't critique Nkrumah until you've actually taken the time to sit down and read something like Conscientism which I've read a little bit of, and it's very, very hard to understand. But, you know, take the time to read and study him before you actually critique him. And I'd say the same thing about some of these Afro-pessimist guys, you know, and I've been critiqued on that, you know. Um, it will take, uh, let's take the time to read and understand them before before coming to any conclusions would yeah, be my advice. That's a, again, I haven't read a lot. This, um, I'm commenting, commenting on the little I've read but from what you said, you know, again, not critiquing him because again, I haven't read a lot on it, but to me, that's a cheap shot. And I feel like having a class analysis is I can sit here and write theory on Afro-pessimism, but when asked about a solution, I don't know, I'm just, uh, that's a cheap shot. That's that's a Ben Shapiro move, honestly. And <laughs> I, I, I think if, 
you are writing about Afro-pessimism, you have to have a solution. You can't just say, well, I'm writing about this thing. Okay, it's up to y'all to do it because now you put yourself in a class interest of the capitalists, as far as I'm concerned. Like you're not putting yourself with the people. And from what I've read about Afro-pessimism, that is my problem, is that it's from the perspective of people who don't look to solutions to these issues. And again, going to a book like How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, I feel like, again, the little I've read about Afro-pessimism doesn't, doesn't go in that vein. And anybody who's asking, why is it we're in the position we're in as Africans need to read that book because it just shows the process how capitalism is organized. It's not like they just came in and said, oh, okay. I mean, Cause you had the Berlin conference. You had a bunch of warring European countries that were like, okay, how can we unify on this one issue to divide Africa? Okay, France, you take Cameroon, you take the, the and so people can't unify even if they're differing. I mean, that's going on right now. And I look at the times right now, that's funny with January 6th, what happened in DC, everybody there who was having this riot, they all have similar class interests. There might be people who are working class there, but their issue is to uphold white supremacy and capitalism, whether or not they want to acknowledge it. And I feel if you're going to maintain an Afro-pessimistic point of view, it's still upholding that. It's like, well, I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't know, y'all got to figure it out. So again, without, you know, without having read uh, in depth about it, I'm just, you know, sort of responding to what you said um, in his response to, you know, I, I don't know, I don't have all the answers. I, I think that's really cheap because there are answers and, um, you know, you can look anywhere from Martin Luther King to Malcolm X to Kwame Nkrumah I mean, there are so many answers you can go to um, to look at a response to Afro-pessimism. So to say this is tied to, you know, where we are now, um, I think we've sort of banked a little too much on a pessimistic point of view about um, where, we're, our, where we are because there is not a land analysis. Power is in land. So power is not in our physical state. It's in our connection to land, it's in our connection to labor. So what do we do with that? So again, I'm just responding to what you said. I, I definitely uh, plan to read a lot more in Afro-pessimism, but I do feel like that's a, that's a cheap shot. It's sort of like my class interest is not um, in fighting for the means of production for the people. I'm just responding to our condition right now. And you know, like, I'm going to step uh, away. I think what, what the last thing, well, one thing I'll just add to that is that um, Wilderson, Frank Wilderson at least, is, he, he doesn't discount class analysis. His point is, so he teaches, he teaches Marx, he teaches capital, you know, he, he, he's been involved in, in South Africa, he's involved in the struggle yeah. against apartheid and so forth. His thing though, or their thing though, is that uh, class is not everything. And, you know, we would all agree with that because you, you remove the class oppression, you're still going to be left with anti-blackness. That's their point. Their point is their point is looking at the anti-blackness and saying the anti-blackness is there. Class analysis is not going to get, you know, class action is or class action. That's not the right word, but is not going to deal with the the anti-blackness. So you got a country like Cuba, for example, where you know one of the most uh, one of the most closest to socialists, actually socialist places on earth at the moment. Um, but it's also riven with anti-blackness. The black people are at the bottom there, you know, generally speaking. Uh, there's been no, th th there's, there hasn't been, there hasn't, they haven't eradicated, you know, anti-blackness from the minds of the Cuban people, of the white Cuban people who are the, the, you know the, the people who are in control there still, and the point that, that so the what they what Afropism, where Afropism, Afro pessimism is useful is getting into that anti blackness and like okay well what is this anti blackness what's this based on it's obviously not just based on 
class exploitation because black people are not a class. You know, we're we're a race and we're being exploited. We're being in the in the in the minds of non-black people. There is this. What is it? What is it about us? Why is it that we're just at the bottom wherever you go across the world, no matter the different kind of um, uh, you know. Um, political systems they have their economic systems they have there and so forth what is it about that um and there so, so, so their, their argument would be that look you can get rid of the class oppression you can get rid of that you can remove that altogether you will still be left <laughs> you'll still be left where is it things will be better so the point is that cuba is a lot better than you know most other parts of the world when it comes for black people yeah absolutely um but it's still anti-blackness is still a thing that still needs to be reckoned with um but i hear you yeah i yeah i, I hear you with regard to you know if you're going to say oh i don't know what the solution is it's 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 not helpful it's not very of any practical use to anybody to to, to people to say that but i think that their analysis is or what they're bringing is 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 um is some kind of language, some kind of concepts to try to get into this anti-blackness, this 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 position that we have um, in the world out that is not fully explained by class analysis. I suppose is what I like, what I like about what they're saying. But it's not it's not it's never going to be a it's not a replacement for for class analysis. It's not a replacement for um, you know for 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 working class solidarity. Uh, you know, particularly in Africa. You know, because in Africa, in, in Africa, um, it's black. As we know, it's neo-colonial. It's a neo-colonial situation. Black people are oppressing other black people with with a lot of support and you know instigation from non-black people. Uh, you know, but ultimately the the protagonists are all black. So you know, we, class is the is 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 the critical thing there to to kind of handle to to get to understand. Uh so I will argue, actually, uh, in terms of Cuba, in terms of Cuba, there's actually been various programs over the years. Uh, if you have something, again, that has been organized in terms of a system, it's going to take a long time to totally eradicate. But there have been programs since the revolution to deal with the issue. And there's actually uh, January 6th, uh, there is news that talks about, this is from, uh, um, Radio HC dot CU Cuba. And so it talks about the Cuban president, Miguel Diaz Canel, ratified his country's commitment to eradifying racism, a priority on the government's agenda. And this was a message uh, published on Twitter. Um, he described racism as a scourge to be erased in the nation with the national program support against race, racism and racial discrimination. A message that we must eliminate in our just an emancipatory society. We have a government program to achieve this goal. And so they have had uh, arts programs. There have been programs to um, honor uh, natural hair. Um, there has been um, an acknowledgement of uh, African spiritual practices. So all of these things have been programmatic over the years to acknowledge the racism that has existed in Cuba. So there is work being done. and. Uh, there are people in the party who have gone to Cuba to see this in action. So it's not like, yeah, you know, the, the, it's, it's, white supremacy is all over the world. So, I mean, you are going to see vestiges of that all over the world, even as people are trying to fight it. And to compare what's happening in Cuba versus what's happening in the UK or Greece or the US, I, I think, there's no comparison to that. There are, you know, with the current Biden administration, um, you know, there's this woke performativeness that, okay, we'll have uh, African as the head of the CIA, for instance, but the CIA is an enemy of African people versus what's happening in Cuba, where there are true concerted efforts to acknowledge its racist past to try to rectify that in some way programmatically. programmatically. So I think there are differences. So yeah, you are going to see racism because there are vestiges of that. And but um, for someone to say, oh, nothing's being that's that's actually not true because there are actual um, again programs to deal with that head on. 
Well, no, no one's saying nothing's been done. That, that oh, no, pe people are saying that, though. I know, but like, that's, not, that's not what Frank... So Frank Wilderson, I, I sound like he's spokesman, but he's specifically, you know, he's been there as well. He's, he's been, visited Cuba. He said that it's his favourite country on earth. You know, like I said, it, you know, it's, it's probably much better in Cuba there for a black person than in many, many, maybe most countries in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's not it's not a, it's not to dismiss any of the progress that's made in a Cuba or in a or in a Venezuela for that matter or or any of these places. Uh, yeah, just I'll just leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people are you know obviously uh, when talking about Cuba and uh, Cuba has once again by the U.S. government has has been put on the terrorist watch list mm. for. The support of Venezuela, etc. So I mean, that, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but anyone who is um, working to deal with the uh, past existence of white supremacy or colonialism or imperialism, I mean, that's you're going to have um, you know way more than than British imperialism at this point. It, the U.S. is working overtime <laughs> in China to protect. Uh, capitalism. And I do want to say, uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie uh, Blackfish. I saw, saw it for the first time last night. And every African needs to watch this movie. So Blackfish is about the SeaWorld controversy and their treatment of the orcas. Okay. When I tell you, I had to look away a number of times. I'm vegan, long-term vegan. And yeah. I, my heart was crying. I had to look away. But the documentary highlights this one orca named Tilikum. And every African needs to watch this movie. Tilikum <laughs> was a political prisoner and a freedom fighter. That's all I'm going to say. You haven't seen it. So I don't want to give away any spoilers. No spoilers. But Tilikum, okay. that I, I will say this. The experience that Africans have faced in its enslavement, and on some levels to this day, because enslavement still happens, let's keep that real. But Tilikum was used as a breeding machine. Tilikum was, his body was used for profit. And when I tell you Tilikum was a freedom fighter and a political prisoner, that's all I'm gonna say, watch it and you know, let me know what you think. Oh, well. <laughs> because, oh, oh, all right. I've never even heard of it before. Oh, so it's called Blackfish. Yeah, I've seen, I've got it on the media oh. here. Yeah, so. Til hmm. so Tilikum was kept on until he passed on. I think he was about 35 years old. And um, male orcas, they, I think they live on average of 35 and, um, Female uh, orcas live to be up to 100, I think. Oh, wow. The, the bond they have with their children, orcas, dolphins are incredibly intelligent beings. And the way they socialize is very similar to humans. And so the treatment for profit from SeaWorld, it matches what happens to Africans all around the world to this day in the, the prison industrial complex to what happened to us when we were being sold on the auction block to everything. And if you look at it from that perspective, <laughs> I, you may not agree, but Tilikum was a freedom fighter and I love Tilikum. <laughs> so if you haven't seen it, wait, please watch it. Uh, yeah, let me know what you think. Get All right, I will. I'll put it, I'll remind <laughs> myself here. Black All right. But, uh, on on that note, I know that you cover a uh, lot of uh, popular subjects or film and TV and developing that with uh, an African perspective, a Pan-Africanist perspective, how did that develop? You're a kid and you're like, oh, TV, whatever. But then you also talked about how you had this conservative perspective. So how did your look at media, how was that shaped by this journey from being a child, uh, being obviously, you know, it, you know, a kid in the UK who is African, being shaped by that, being like, oh, I need to 
what's what's the all the shows that they had oh they used to have them over here um are you being served and you know, yeah. <laughs> all those shows. <laughs> but then you also had um man what's the show with the jamaicans i gotta go to work i gotta go to work. uh the the real mccoy i don't know um no uh De desmond's the desmond's so yeah i got to go to work i got to go to work and so obviously you know that's the stereotype of jamaicans they have 12 jobs and you know so uh, yeah, and what do they say there's truth in stereotypes because they did that in the U.S. too within Living Color. Like they did a, a parody of the Desmonds. <laughs> and so it was like, I've got to go to work. And so with okay. that, but then you had that was uh, Jamaicans being uh, in the working class versus, you know, are you being served or um, all those other TV shows from Downton Abbey sort of represents this duality of society so we're just we got to go to work all the time to work for these people so how as a kid watching some of those shows and growing into an analysis and then sort of in the middle of that you have sort of these conservative leaning viewpoints so how are all of these things in terms of media shaping your worldview shaping your analysis into the journey that you are experiencing today? Mm, okay, so big questions. Uh, big question. Uh, the, so I, w the generation I'm from, you know, grew up in the 80s and 90s. And uh, in those days, there weren't that many black people on TV in Britain anyway, or, or you know, we didn't, we didn't have black radio stations, we had pirate radio stations, which were illegal, um, you know, uh, community state community stations playing our music, but there was nothing on the mainstream. So yeah, when you looked at the TV, there was there's the old joke that whenever there was black people on TV, you'd be like, "Oh, there's black people on TV!" Yeah, you know, "Mummy, quick, 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 look, look, come!" In our house, we wouldn't even say that. We wouldn't even verbalize it. You know, we just say, "Oh, look, come, come, look," and you'd be, oh, "All right, sit down and watch. Well, what's what's going to happen here? What's what's this guy going to do then?" <laughs> you know. Um, and yeah, the, the the stereotyping of of black people, the the the, the we were basically either going to be robbers or you know, um, clown type figures. So uh, the are you being served? And in sickness and in health was another program with a guy called Alf Garnett, who oh, I mean, just there was this character in it. I can't remember the actor's name, but he was like this. This he was meant to be African. And he was just like outlandishly sort of effeminate kind of, but just, and like a joke figure. He'd be like, you know, almost like, it was almost like a, I don't know, like the play thing of this Alf Garnet guy, I don't know. And it was just like, I remember watching it when I was young and just being like, what the heck? The one black guy that I see on TV, you know, this week. And it's this dude who's just like demasculized and just, you know, um, just a joke figure. And yeah, you, you know, you, you made fun of, you had comedians like, uh, what's the guy's name? D uh, Davidson, Jim Davidson, that was his name. And he would just like, you know, he had, a, he, had a, he had a Caribbean friend called Chalky and he just used to like do the stupid fake Jamaican accent and just like make a mockery of this character in his stand up performances. So, you know, it was just, it was all ridicule, all, or like uh, ridicule slash um, danger you know, the criminal black people, or obviously on the news and then days that Ethiopia, the famine in Ethiopia uh, was was live. And then a little bit later on, obviously, um, Rwanda, the, the, the situation in Rwanda. So it was all doom and gloom. And so me, me growing up, I, I, I was really into media. So I studied, I, I, at uni, I did media and cultural studies. And so I, I learned all about that. I learned all about, you know, semiotics and you know how how race is represented in film and tv and what this speaks to what the what these representations reveal about society and how they how they interplay with uh the the, the you know p political economy how we are positioned in the society as uh, you know as far as uh economics wealth uh, crime, punishment, all these kinds of things. You know, I was, I was, yeah, that's that's always been me, and that's never changed. Actually, I've always I've always been someone who, 
you know, I'm not going to sit down and watch everything that I watch. I'm going to find some kind of angle in there that's to do with like, my wife gets annoyed of it sometimes. She's just like, do you not just want to watch something stupid and just not think? I'm like, mm, not really. <laughs> you know, I sort of, you know, I, I just get, I get annoyed if I, if I'm, if I'm watching something that just has nothing of any, uh, even friends, I'll sit there and watch friends. I'll be like, yeah, but you see what's going on. All these guys, they're all connected with their heritage. Ross with his Jewish heritage and, you know, uh, what's, what's his, Matt, Matt, the guy, the Italian guy, uh, Joey, Joey with his Italian American ancestry, you know, so in my wife's like, oh, give it a rest. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so, um, so yeah, always, always been, a, always been, always looked deeper into the media um, than just the surface level and always, you know, because, because I know what those images and representations can, can do to the self-esteem and the self-image of black people, because it happened to me, you know, so I've always, I've always, I've always uh, been in that uh, mindset. The conservative phase, you know, funnily enough, I probably nothing changed in that regard. All I probably would would have said would have been, yeah, but you just need to ignore all that. That's true. Yes, they are. We are being depicted as criminals and idiots and fools and dangerous and so forth. But just ignore that and just just get on with yourself and make you know, come, you know, do your own thing and come up with your own come up with our own media outlets. Then in that case and so forth. So that, that wouldn't have actually. I've never not known that the media is a is a tool of psychological psychic violence against black people and other people but it definitely is a tool of psychic violence against black people um and yeah it's been quite interesting so the last yeah last few months i've not i, didn't, I hadn't really done much of that before on my channel on africans arise you know media breaking down media and, and this kind of stuff and for some reason i would never really done that before but um it was it was really Jared, uh, Jared Ball, who um, kind of, um, no, it wasn't. No, that's right. Um, Small Axe, the Small Axe series came out and that's unheard of in this country. We don't, we don't have series that are just focused on black stuff anymore. You did back in the eighties and nineties, you don't now. And so when that came out, I was like, I, I have to talk about this. I have to, I have to do something about this, particularly the first one, which is about the, uh, the Mangrove Nine case. And I was like, I have to talk about this. I have to break this down. I have to review it. I have to talk about what, you know, the, my recollections and my memories about being an African growing up in this country, surrounded mainly by people from the Africans from the Caribbean and all the, the different dynamics that that, that came. And, and so for, just for people who might, you know, who won't know, like for me, my all of, most of my political, my black consciousness came from uh, our Caribbean family, our African Caribbean family, through the reggae music, Rastafari. When I was young, grew up in an African family. Grew up in it, you know, born in. I was born in Africa and came here when I was young. Grew up in African family. The only time I heard positive stuff about Africa growing up was not in my house. It was from listening to Bob Marley. It was listening to Peter Tosh. It was listening to you know, Bernie and Spear and these. And I, I remember listening and they'd be going on about. Ethiopia and Africa and I'm like Ethiopia is like the, the famines like what do you mean last I heard from Ethiopia it was to do with like the famine now you're here talking about glorifying it and you know magnifying it and so forth and Marcus I first heard about Marcus Garvey through um Burning Spear actually you know um because he sang about him all the time and so um so yeah so uh, I've always got this kind of affinity to our African Caribbean brothers and sisters because they created this black community that we have in this country and like I'm just walking in their footsteps kind of thing so when that small when the small acts the the, the um, mangrove film came out I was just like oh yeah this is kind of this is speaking to that heritage that kind of helped to make me who I am you know so um yeah and then since then I've done a couple more different kinds of things and like now with with Jared and I mix what I like and some other guys we're planning to do another one next month about um what's that thing called I haven't watched American Skin I think and um One Night in My I haven't watched any of them I'm not expecting much but uh, but yeah it's a good way doing the media breakdowns are a good way of connecting with people who wouldn't perhaps normally be bothered about political things 
because then you can talk about these things, you talk about the, the the stuff that they've seen and start to bring out like stuff they probably wouldn't have thought of before, you know, and making those historical connections and so forth. So um, yeah, that's that's kind of kind of where the media stuff kind of fits in for me at the moment. Well, I have not seen Small Axe. Um, oh. I don't have Amazon. So <laughs> okay. But I did see your discussion and one of the things that interested me the most, I actually listened to it when I was at my job. It's like, okay. I love it. But Thank one you. of the things that interested me uh, is as usual, so the erasure of more revolutionary voices. Mm. And I didn't see it, so I can't go into detail about that, but you did have a conversation around that. And one of the people we are honoring in this episode is Claudia Jones. Mm -hmm. And who gets ignored in this whole thing? I know people today have carnival. And there was a one photo of Adele where she had the Jamaican bikini. <laughs> she had the bantu on. <laughs> so there was there was a debate around that. But losing the roots of carnival. And so one of the things. Um, with Claudia Jones is she was in the Communist Party mm -hmm. at one time. And so leaving out as everything as, as capitalist media does, sort of leaving out a revolutionary framework to things that are celebrated today. Uh, you know, the commodification of carnival leaving out the roots. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just want to say a uh, quote from Claudia Jones. She talked about uh, she says, it was out of my Jim Crow experiences as a young Negro woman, experiences likewise born of working class poverty that led me to join the Young Communist League and to choose the philosophy of my life, the science of Marxism Leninism. That philosophy not only rejects racist ideas, but is the antithesis of them. And obviously a lot of the Africans did join the Communist Party at one point or did espouse uh, Marxist and Leninist ideas and evolve that into a Pan-Africanism mm -hmm. or um, other aspects of Pan-Africanism or uh, African political life. And uh, I also think of Jackie Robinson who was staunchly anti-communist and he was uh, questioned by the House of Un-American Activities. If you are interested, read all of those transcripts. But, and I am paraphrasing right here, but Jackie Robinson straight up said, and I'm paraphrasing, um, yes, I'm anti-communist and blah, blah, blah. But the fact that communists can acknowledge that racism exists in this country and the US is not doing anything about it, that says a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the fact that um, a lot of Africans uh, did gravitate towards communism or Marxist-Leninism Marxist uh, just says a lot to uh, our state as African people. Like we want to gravitate towards something where we see we're going to achieve some sort of liberation. And, you know, yes, there's a stopping point or whatever, and we can move on for something where we can largely identify with on our own, on our own terms. But um, to ignore that side, that sort of revolutionary side, of African thought um, in media, in British media. Um, so watching small acts, um, and I think it's, didn't they use the uh, the Trojan Records label or something on that? Is that, did I see that? The music from, you mean, in the, in the soundtrack of the, the show or? Yeah. Yeah, it was all, yeah, the, the music was all, yeah, um, rock steady and oh, okay. reggae from, yeah, w which would have been put out by Trojan or, yeah, was put out by Trojan later, yeah. Okay, so I did, I, I, so I was like, are they using the Trojan little? Like, what's going on? But um, your thoughts around the erasure of revolutionary thought um, in, I don't know, I, I know it was a series, but in the particular uh, episode of Mangrove Nine. Like, what is, what are some further thoughts around that? I know you did talk about that with Jared Ball, but um, do you have any extra thoughts around that? The erasure of revolutionary voices and 
people in movement? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's um, the, the person to go to is Dr. Keto Swan, I will say, because when we had our conversation, this guy, he's, he's, he's Bermudan. He's not even based here in Britain. And I'm sat there and he's telling me about all these things to do. Yeah, and so this guy at that time, he also worked with Claudia Jones and then Claudia Jones, what you don't know is that Amy, you know, one of the Amy Jakes Garvey or Ashford Garvey was also there at that time and they got together and da, 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 da. And then did you know that the parents, and I'm like, dude, why, <laughs> why are you embarrassing us like this, man? I don't know anything about this. He's the man of, you know, to, to really delve into all of those kind of, um, the histories behind, you know, all of that. I, I think so. So I think that the erasure of and the sanitization of of all of that is is very interesting. I basically think that the reason why we're getting your small axes now, you know, and the reason why the reason why we're having some of these things is because the powers that be must see that, you know, must sense the wind, you know, the change in the wind. And they're trying their best to co-opt black people before they end up, you know, in the hands of these revolutionaries kind of thing. That's what they're trying to do. So these, that's exactly what shows like um, Small Axe, all those Small Axe shows are aimed at doing is telling black people, don't worry, no, 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 just, just head on, head on back over here. It's all right. Look, we're including you now. So come on, come on back. It's, it's everything's fine. Don't, don't worry about all that, you know. And so, of course, they're going to present us with these, these uh, explanations of, of history that, like, are going to strip out your Claudia Joneses and, 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 and so forth. Um, and, but what's the sad thing, actually? I mean, you mentioned communism. And I wanted to mention when you talked about you read that quote from Nkrumah at the beginning about, um, you know, the, the revolution, you know, the, the pan-Africanism, you know, United Socialist Africa, and, you know, the, the aim being communism. And the, the funny thing is, I think both on, I personally think that both on the, even amongst revolutionary pan-Africanists, but definitely amongst some of the more cultural nationalist Africa, pan-Africanists, that communism word, and concept is like, ah, no, you know, this is, get away from there. So for the cultural nationalist, it's like, I don't know. So my, my thing I posted today on YouTube was, I could have said the same thing about that. I could have said that, you know, some of these guys don't want to talk about communism and socialism because I, I think they just don't understand it. I don't, I don't think they understand those concepts. They don't think they've read Marx even or Nkrumah or you know Toure, Kwame Toure or Sekou Toure. They haven't, they haven't read these guys. They haven't, um, and they don't. They, they kind of caricature what what communism is, as stated by some of the communist pioneers. You know, um, but I even think I would personally say as well that. Um, oh, and sorry, I do think some of the, some of our cultural nationalist brothers and sisters push comes to shove are attached to capitalism, you know, and they can't see outside of capitalism as a framework for living. They just want us to have, you know, a black capitalism, basically. That's why they push all the black, buy black this, and, you know, that's why they push, because that's what they want. That's all they, that's all they see. And that's why, that's also why they're so easily impressed by some of these leaders in Africa who are, who can spout some of these things or do some of these things, like an Idi Amin, they're like, oh, he's great because he kicked out the Asians. It's like, yeah, but do you know anything about what actually happened in Uganda for black people under him? Probably not, you know? Um, but then also, commun for me, like, I think of my understanding of communism is a stateless and classless society. But I often, f I don't often find even revolutionary Pan Africanists talk much about that aspect of, of, Communism. It's often just talking about the socialism and like a, as a general principle for, of, you know, justice and, you know, the, oh, you know, the workers are in control as a general, you know, general, you know, kind of vague thing, but not actually, not actually speaking uh, in any detail about how, about a classless and stateless society might look like. And actually, I think that's doing, I think that's doing a great disservice to our cause because I think people will be greatly inspired to hear like oh so you're talking about a society where 
we would be in control of our, you know, our our localities and our and our product. We would like, you know, actually literally be in control and not have to go through some bureaucracy or, or this, that, and the other. People would love that. And I think more and more, as life just gets more and more crazy <laughs> over the years, I th personally, I, th I think, I mean, I'm, you know, it's just a hunch, but I think more and more people would be open for, you know, socialists and communists being very explicit about what they're talking about. Um, but then obviously communism has just been so demonized, you know, that it's like, you might as well be, it's like going into a church and saying, oh, I'm an atheist, guys, let's turn to atheism. Like, what the hell are you talking about? That's kind of like what communism is for a lot of people. It's just like. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think that uh, like everything else, particularly in the West, um, political thought, economic thought is uh, tied primarily to European thought. So people argue, well, communism, not Jew, that's not for us, that's not for Africans. Socialism, that's not for Africans. That's, you know, that's, that's European talk, why you wanna go there? So, but we need to understand that everything has a transitory period. Nothing lasts forever. So you had communalism, then you had feudalism, then you had slavery. Now you're in the period of capitalism, which is at its final stages. And so I know we're talking about uh, Lenin and the sort of uh, imperialism being the final stage of capitalism. And then, you know, um, and, you know, and Kumar writes about this with imperialism and colonialism and sort of being the final stage of capitalism, which is happening, which is you're having this hyper capitalism and everything can be commodified right now. And so then the transitory period, which you're seeing, you're seeing the beginnings of socialism happening around the world. So when people, oh, socialism has failed. It's like, we haven't had socialism. So how do you know it's failed? Can you explain that to me? Well, Russia. So everyone goes to Russia and China without understanding what happened in Grenada, what ha what, without understanding what happened in Guinea-Bissau, what, without understanding the history of the Cuban revolution. And so people go to these two countries. <laughs> without studying the world. So there has not been communism. So to say that it's failed or it, it won't work or it doesn't work, you don't know whether or not it's working out because it hasn't happened. And having a political party that says it's communist, that's the objective. It hasn't happened yet because it happened, hasn't happened around the world. So for Africans to um, call themselves like cultural nationalists or whatever and not uh, having studied communalism or this whole idea of, oh, you know, we're kings and queens. It's like, no, <laughs> because the notion of uh, being, a, a, having a feudalist society, it's hierarchical. So we all weren't kings and queens, which is why it was easy to uh, transition into enslavement because it maintains this hierarchical system. And then with capitalism, you had industrialization and it's easy to profit off of this hierarchical system. There's a gender hierarchy, land hierarchies, class hierarchies, et cetera. So people are starting to understand with technology and the internet, you can study all this stuff. You're like, oh, as you, as you were saying, capitalism is theft. So more and more people are starting to realize that. And I'm like, okay, no, I, I don't like what happened in Guatemala. It's like, Oh, y'all are deciding what happens to our future without our knowledge? Okay, we're gonna burn the Congress. So <laughs> this is happening all over the world. And you know, I, people talk about the yellow jackets in France or whatever, but this is happening literally all over the world. Raising tuition in Chile, okay, we're gonna be out in the streets in the thousands. So this is something that is going to, to be a transitory period, and of course. Um, you know, the UK, or should I say England in particular, the US, uh, Germany, they're trying to hold on to the last vestiges of that. And so they're going to ramp up uh, imperialist attacks on countries that are fighting imperialism or neocolonialism. Uh, so this is going to happen. So for Africans to say, oh, you know, communism, that, that it, you don't know that. And that means you haven't studied the history of why we need that. 
<laughs> if you're gonna hold on to this idea that we need more business, we need. And the thing is, you can have a business as an African, but somebody has to make those products, and it's usually by slave labor. Kids are probably uh, making those sneakers or those tennis shoes or whatever. <laughs> uh, kids are making those possibly. Um, people are getting paid 10 cents an hour. So there is a level of exploitation that is getting left out when talking about this idealism of the free market, which doesn't exist. I mean, we see that with the, the GameStop thing that's happening. Um, you know, people intentionally wanting a business to fail so they can make money off of it. <laughs> so, uh, so to think that your business is going to somehow be as successful as a Walmart or an Amazon or a whatever a trillion dollar multinational corporation, it's like, that's not the way capitalism works. And they're gonna make sure that you don't fail or that you do fail. And then when you do, they're gonna buy you out. That's usually how it works. And then if you have your, again, your own business, how much are you paying the employees? Uh, if you're the only, uh, if you're the only person running your business, you have to work all day, and that's at the expense of rest. That's at the expense of spending time with your family or your friends or whatever. So, to even opt for, to imagine, to work towards, to organize towards a better world, which is socialism and then communism, why would somebody be opposed to that? Even if it is a European idea. Okay, we could take that and then say, okay, we're going to use that for African liberation. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the reason the reason is that people's imaginations are are shaped are, are uh, in chains. Frankly, that's that's what it is, and I, I include myself in this as well. You know, um, it's it's hard to imagine what doesn't exist, um, but. We, as black people, we don't have the luxury. We don't have the luxury of um, not being imaginative. Frankly, we don't have that luxury because if we, if we're really serious about changing our lot in this world, we have to get creative. We have to think outside of the box, you know. Um, and unfortunately, uh, yeah, this by black stuff and you know black capitalism and stuff. It's kind of holds such sway. I had some talking to some workmen recently like you know black guys uh, that I know and it's just like it, the conversations always end up going that yeah we need to start our own businesses you know <laughs> whatever it's whatever situation we're talking about it's always yeah start our own businesses it's like oh good grief like literally like the the the, the go-to solution to everything is like start your own businesses as if like I mean so maybe that's you know that's one of my our jobs is to like break down like look this is not a, you know the, my thing is that that isn't business isn't even how those who are wealthy today got wealthy particularly when you're looking on a geopolitical level you know britain did not become wealthy by being excellent traders and just knowing how to corner markets <laughs> you know what i mean like rule britannia britannia rules the waves you know that song is is speaking to the violence that britain engaged in to you know, to corner the seas and to, to, to ins you know, to go and invade, you know, what is it, it's one quarter of the world or three, like the, the whole world has been invaded by Britain at some point and invasion means violence and slavery and all these kinds of things. And Kruma said, so um, Brother Sari, when I interviewed him um, on the channel and, uh, from APRP Britain, he reminded me of the quote, seek first to kick, seek you first the political kingdom. And that is the case that, you know, you're not gonna business your way to liberation. You can perhaps use business as a means, what, but the first thing you have to do is you have to take control. You have to take political control. And I think one of the, one of the things uh, for, so I'm kind of working on a video possibly on black capitalism, uh, but one of the things that has dawned on me or that I have to remind myself is that particularly here in Britain, and I'm sure in a lot of other countries, because we don't really have a critical mass of black people here, the number of our is very, very small. Um, it's unlikely we're ever going to be able to get political power in black hands in this country, you know. So I can understand how a lot of people would just go, oh, let's do because you can start a business, you know what I mean? Anyone can start a business. 
So you can do that. But it does speak to, you mentioned Mutabaruka's thing there. And it's like, it does speak to, okay, what's, what's the viability of black life in a country like Britain long-term, you know, you know, I don't know. <laughs> anyway. With, with that point, this is why organizing for a unified socialist Africa is the objective because uh, if we're living under a white supremacist um, settler colonial nation, like for instance in Brazil or the US or Australia, New Zealand, Israel, if we're living that and then with an uh, imperialist force like England, um, you know, once we have this force of, you know, fighting imperialism and neocolonialism in Africa, if Africans own the means of production, if Africans have a unified political party, a system where we can, you know, be at the table, and this is not like I'm sitting at the table, but literally having that political power and political unity and economic unity, you are going to see the effects of that wherever we are, whether we are in Britain, whether we are in the US, whether we are in Tokyo, whether we are in Russia. Mm. So that is really the role. So to say, okay, you know, I understand my lot in life is to just be in white man country or whatever, and I'm just going to make a business. Like, no, we have to be fighting towards something better for ourselves mm. and understand that you're literally in another country right now from where I am and we can unify on this issue about our liberation. We're using technology, which yes, was sadly mined by children. And, you know, that, that's a whole other episode, um, but that's the dialectical relationship between um, this work and this thought. Like we can use technology and organize towards a place in a system where that doesn't have to happen. This is a tool, but the objective is to not get rid of the tool, it's to get rid of the system to create the oppression which mines the tools. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so this whole idea of like, well, you're anti-capitalist, why do you have a job? Or um, <laughs> that makes no sense. It's like, oh, well, you're anti-capitalist, why are you spending money? It's like, money's a tool. What do you, what you do with it is the point. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we must look at, everything dialectically and say, okay, even with capitalism, yes, we're working to fight capitalism and we understand that capitalism is inhumane, but capitalism has brought us this technology, the exploitation of labor has brought us this technology. So again, what do we do with that? We can say, okay, sure. Okay, next. So uh, this whole uh, essentialist idea that you must get rid of something without a transitory period, it's like, well, what, what happens when you don't have cops? It's like, well, uh, when we don't have cops, that means that we have community defense. And that means we work towards that point where we can have that. It's not just not having something in place of it, but people, uh, you know, we would talk about pessimism. It's like, oh, we don't have this thing I'm so used to, then we'll have nothing. <laughs> so that's not what it's about. That's not what this work is about. And you know, having a space to discuss ideas to organize. Yes, increasingly, you know, Google, uh, Twitter, all these social media uh, companies. Uh, yeah, they do their best to distract you from that thought uh, by demonetizing people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, or even cutting people off. But that doesn't mean the work isn't isn't happening outside of that. So what do we do? <laughs> you know, that, that's the key. What do we do in spite of these roadblocks that continue to happen in the face of capitalism? What do we do? We, uh, you know what? We continue to organize and all, and I think uh, with the online stuff, think about the online challenges and stuff, that, that's reminded me, and someone brought it up in one of my, one of my streams actually was, uh, that reminded me that the organizing has to be offline in the main you know like what i've i've got sucked into this thing of everything's got to be online and you talk about everything that you're doing on the live streams on the videos but no 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 you the, the power real power lies in people coming together physically 
and talking together and working together and planning together and organizing and you know taking action in the streets you know where needed um and supporting those who are taking action actual action elsewhere and you know all this online stuff is this at best this is like um you know um it's a tool to assist with the organizing isn't it it's not the organizing you know um so so yeah that's 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 one of the things I, and it's it's a wake up call for me because i'm not currently currently in an organization and i that i need to sort that out you know i need to i need to start <laughs> i need to start organizing you know together with people you know um so yeah <laughs> There, there, there is a UK chapter in Yes, I'm very aware of the UK, the Britain chapter of the AAPLP. <laughs> no, but there, the, to your point, the revolution will not be, be televised. I think that the Gil Scott Heron piece holds true to this day. People do allude to revolutionaries being commodified, but as you're saying, and as many people have said, revolutions or organizing happens offline. So something like this podcast, something like what people are doing on social media, those are uh, pro pro programmatic tools yeah. to build the work. It's not the work itself. Yeah. And you know, uh, uh, I think a lot of people are not attracted to organizing because it's not sexy. It's like, mm -hmm. well, oh, I have to spend my life doing meetings. I have to, hey, I have to do what? Mm -hmm. Because people look at organizing, just the conversations I've had, people look at organizing like, I'm going to be in the front lines in the street. And then that's a revolution. Mm -hmm. Revolutions are not singular. Revolutions are ongoing. Revolutions are, again, not sexy. And so when people figure that out, they go, oh, okay, well, I thought, I thought this was going to be fun. It's like, mm -hmm. no, most of yeah. the work to get to the point of liberation is not fun. You lose no. friends sometimes. You lose sleep sometimes, <laughs> yeah. but it's worth it in the end because there is an objective to look to. So to um, to all the people, you know, showing these videos of people in the street, that is one aspect of it. But there's so many of us, who's going to do childcare? Who's going to drive people to the event? Who is going to be facilitating meetings? Who's going to be taking minutes? Who's going to be cooking? Who's going to be cleaning? Who's going to be passing out flyers? There's a lot of roles in the revolution that could occur. It's not just people on the front lines. And um, another thing people say, well, you know, I don't want to use guns. And like people, yes, revolutions can be bloody. And, you know, but that's not all there is to it. Again, there are so many blocks that are built to create a formation and to leave all of these things out. It's again, to me, looking at the same argument like, well, um, the good thing about capitalism is competition, but people leave out all the labor that's included and exploited in order to build that business to be on the, in order to compete. So it's the same thing. People look at what's sexy about revolution, but ignore all the work that it takes to get to that point. Mm -hmm. So uh, organizing, it, it will never be televised, even though parts of it are on social media uh, or, you know, you're seeing people in the streets protest with signs or whatever, but there is a lot that is built in order to get to that point and you're not seeing that televised. So when people are like, yeah, I'm going to join an organization. Yeah, this is great. And then when you, they start going to meetings, they're like, oh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. I thought it was something else. And even a political, um, a, a political education process, like political education process is a building block to build an organization. It is to build an analysis. So when you go out and do the work outside of political education, outside of a work study process, you understand and you're able to disseminate that information. You're able to have conversations with people about the work you're doing or what the objective is. And when somebody's like, uh, well, why are you going to your job if you hate capitalism? You're able to explain why you need a job in order to make <laughs> your ends meet, in order to eat. Like you can actually explain why outside of the the theoretically. So that is why political education is important. 
that's why having uh, programmatic tools to build an organization is important. They're all building blocks to, in order to reach an objective and none of them can be separate from one another. So you're absolutely right in that, <laughs> you know, this is not uh, going to be televised. It's not, it's not romantic. Yeah. Um, it's something that you definitely have to love to do, but it's not always fun. So yeah. it, it's, it's something we have to, to realize, like most of us don't enjoy going to our jobs, but we do it. Yeah. It's not like, yeah, I'm going to my job. So why not look at organizing in that way? Not like a job, but um, you know, it's something you have to do to get to an objective. You go to your job so you can pay your rent or your mortgage or get food because under capitalism, that's just not happening. There's no free health care. So you have to get a job in order to have health care. Because if you have uh, what's the called the affordable care act, it's not even affordable, but if you don't have insurance, you have to pay a fine when you pay your taxes. So it's not free. So you need a job in order to have insurance. So yeah, just to, to meet your basic needs in this society. So to have a work study process, to have a political education process, you're able to build that analysis so you know why these things are going on. And organizing is part of that. And it's not sexy. Okay, okay, people, it's not, but it is absolutely worth it because it is something to look forward to. And the other thing, the last thing I'll say about this is that um, people also look to organizing or mobilizing uh, in particular because it's a, a short solution to a long-term problem. So people are like, well, yeah, I want this thing done now. We gotta have the cops stop shooting us or whatever. But you have to understand why the cops are shooting us, why there are state sanctioned murders, just marching in the streets and being like, okay, well, there's this reform that happened. Yay, it's still gonna, it's still gonna continue to happen. So people look at organizing as this quick result when no, uh, organizing is a lifetime. But whether you go to from one organization to another, you still have to do it to meet your objectives. <laughs> so it's not like you're gonna have this quick result of something because it's a long-standing problem. Capitalism is hundreds of years old. So you're not gonna stop a system of oppression in a year or two or even 10. And so the reason I can speak for myself, the reason why I'm organizing is so the future generations can see uh, a future in which their humanity is valued, in which um, the work they've put in, and I'm not even talking about work in terms of capitalism, but the work that they've put in into their humanity is valued. Um, that there are no gender hierarchies, that there are no class hierarchies, that there are um, no land hierarchies, that these, these, these imaginary borders can go away and we can all honor the land and indigenous people get their land back. Like that's, a, that's what I'm fighting for. And that's what I'm organizing for. And I know that's not gonna happen in my lifetime. But what we're seeing now is a move towards that. So mm. obviously this is working. <laughs> so that's what I'm gonna say to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's not sexy. <laughs> that's the key. <laughs> um, but it's necessary. And it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of, um, I've been thinking recently about people's conception of like l life and that this, this sort of individualistic view of like, oh, this is just my little one chance to, to live. And then once I'm gone, then that's it. And there's nothing else. And so, you know, that leads you to just want to want it all now. And if you can't get it all now, then you don't bother. But perhaps we need to, you know, pivot a bit more toward a world view or, or, a, or a ontological view. I don't know if that's the right word that sees that's more in tune with some of our traditional spiritual systems or even some ancient uh, ways of thinking whereby you know we're not we're not absent from the from what happened before us and we're also not absent from what's to come you know but I don't know I'll, I'm gonna need to um, head off soon sorry my um I can hear my little one in tears downstairs and I'm, <laughs> I need to um, go and assist unfortunately. Um, yes, 
So I'll say this last quote and then I'll get some last words from you. And then if you can talk about you know, how people can reach you. So this is a quote from Walter Rodney, another person we're honoring in this episode. He says, one of the major dilemmas inherent in the intent by black people to break through the cultural aspects of white imperialism is that posed by the use of historical knowledge as a weapon in our struggle. We are virtually forced into the invidious position of proving our humanity by citing cultural uh, antecedents. And yet the evidence is too often submitted to the white racist for sanction. The white man has already implanted numerous historical myths in the minds of black people. And that, that's definitely to the points that you made. <laughs> and those have to be uprooted. It is necessary to direct our historical activity in the light of two basic principles. Firstly, the effort must be directed solely towards freeing and mobilizing black minds. There must be no performances to impress whites, but those whites who find themselves beside us in the firing line will be there for reasons far more profound than their exposure to African history. Secondly, the acquired knowledge of African history must be seen as directly relevant but secondary to the concrete tactics and strategies which are necessary for our liberation. There must be no false distinctions between reflection and action. If there is to be any proving of our humanity, it must be by revolutionary means. Yeah. Gosh, hey, amen. As ever. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, any final thoughts or words and how can people reach you? Um, final thoughts. Um, it's been a it's been a great conversation. Um, I hope you have me on again one day. By the way, yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah. Final thoughts um, to, to sum up is that um, yeah, political political education is key, and organizing is key. Uh, it it takes a level of maturity to stick at it, you know, uh, particularly when you see people come in for the, you know, the razzmatazz and the, the hype, and then they, you know, quietly, quietly leave exit stage left when the hype dies down, do you know what I mean? When the crowds have gone and it's like, oh, someone needs to put the chairs away, <laughs> you know, or when the crowds have gone and like you say, and like, okay, so who's gonna type up the minutes <laughs> or whatever, who's gonna, who's, you know, um, but it does take that maturity. That's that's. Um, I'm glad that I know of people here in the UK uh, who uh, met some members of the chapter, you know, who have stuck it out and continuing to organise, continue, continuing to do the work while it's not very sexy, while they're not getting the acclaim on social media and so forth. Uh, and um, that's definitely my takeaway from this conversation, and many other takeaways is, um, you know, is it, is it's a priority. I must make it a priority for me personally to be in organization with my brothers and sisters who are seeking to put into practice what um Walter Rodney spoke about there in that quote and yeah it's the aim is to it's not to make our individual lives better necessarily I mean it might you know things go really quickly it might do but probably probably won't let's face it you know um but do you want to, you know what I mean? Do you want to sit down and tell your children or grandchildren or whatever, nieces and nephews that, yeah, I, because I couldn't be bothered, you know, because I didn't, wasn't going to see an in improvement in my life, I just didn't bother. And they're like, look at the world. Why didn't you do what you could to, do you know what I mean? To sow the seeds kind of thing. So that's that's kind of, that's that's the challenge. That's the, that's the challenge I have. And, you know, thank you for illuminating that challenge and, and exhort exhorting me to you know to to step up um and yeah so africans arise is the name of my youtube channel and um you can find me on social media just do africans arise i'm on i'm on facebook now actually i, I went back on facebook after some years of abstinence um because that's where people are basically so i had to <laughs> jump back on there on twitter as well at africans arise and um yeah for, for africans arise on my channel just yeah look out for I'm going to try to be doing some more in-depth content over the next, you know, in coming weeks and months. So I'm doing less frequent videos. I was doing weekly live streams for that the last two, three months, but that's not sustainable. That leaves me no time to, to be doing anything else, frankly. Um, so yeah, less frequent videos, but more in-depth, more to the point, less bothering about seeking the 
sexy views like oh look at all the views i'm getting on this because i'm talking about something that's so current you know and more let me put some material out there that is going to be of benefit to this process that we're talking about political education and so forth if i get 10 views doesn't matter if those 10 people who view it are people who are going to then go off and use it as a tool in their practical organizing and so forth that has got to be my aim i must remember that um but um but yeah thank you but no it's been a, it's been an honor and a pleasure and um really really um nourishing conversation for reasoning to, to have with you my sister so thank you for thank you for having me and i, I hope hope you'll have me back one day <laughs> absolutely thank you so much african to rise <laughs> forward ever <laughs> and backward never <laughs> yes, <that's right. laughs> all right